Welcome to Project Management Paradise. My name is Suzanne Cairns. I'm the head of marketing for Core Systems and your host for today's episode. In today's episode, the topic is performance based hiring. And I think it's extremely relevant considering the job market that we're currently in, which is uh, essentially turning into an employee's market. So an uh, important time to be talking about this topic. Um, and to give us some insight into performance-based hiring, today we're joined by Lou Adler. Um, Lou, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Hey, delighted to be here with you, Suzanne. Thank you very much for inviting me. You're welcome. So Lou, Tell us a little bit about you. Tell us about your background and I suppose why you became known as the Sherlock Holmes of recruitment. Well, that's a pretty big question. So we don't have that long a podcast, but I know that the first question is going to be, tell me about yourself. And it's interesting that that's kind of a common question that can, or interviewers ask candidates. And I make the contention, it's a stupid question. Not yours is a stupid question, but uh, so the context that I'll change it, but we might want to give some interviewing advice here, rather than ask, tell me about yourself to a candidate, why don't you do something like this? If you're a hiring manager, describe a challenge you have in the job. Hey, we have a project that's going downhill and uh, we're about three months behind. Can you tell me about something you've accomplished that's related to that where you've recovered uh, that project? So the idea of tell me about yourself is so open-ended that you know, the answer doesn't mean anything. Some candidates are going to practice, some candidates aren't going to know anything, and some are going to sound good because they can uh, give you some glib response. But the idea, if you narrow the focus to something realistic, it becomes a meaningful question. So now, now I'll answer your question, Suzanne. I'm sorry I do that. Uh, this could be a one question podcast, but so the idea, my background is very weird. Uh, I started out in engineering and manufacturing, got into financial planning and budgeting and cost controls was running a company when I was a very young man, very old now, but, uh, and I just hated the group president and I decided I'm going to become a recruiter. It was only because I started using recruiters and they were only working 40 hours a week and I was working 80 hours a week. So, uh, but when I got into recruiting, I realized that too many people get into it or uh, they really don't look at it as a business process. And when I started doing it, I realized, no, hiring can be a business process. You don't need a lot of candidates if you do everything right, if you interview properly, if you close properly. So it became a business process for hiring and only because my background had been that in business systems, manufacturing systems, data systems. So, uh, so that's the long, very long story with an introduction on training in how I got into this whole field. So let me just leave it at that. So and then we'll go from there. Okay, well, you've pointed out one of the pitfalls, I suppose, of interviewing, but um, I'm sure there's others that you could um, give us insight into when it comes to interviewing. What are the typical downfalls that the interviewers um, end up making? Well, the big one, and it's consistent, is you don't know the job. I mean, it's clear that from a Every piece of research from Google to serious studies around the world, if you don't clarify expectations, even when you're managing a person, the person is going to do stuff that could be off kilter. I mean, it's just as common sense. Hey, you know, Suzanne, you've got to put together 10 podcasts in the next three weeks with people who understand worldwide hiring. Well, that's a pretty clear expectation. But on the other hand, say, hey, put some podcasts together, Suzanne. Well, you're not going to know what good or bad is. So the idea of clarifying expectations after the person's hired is obsolete critical. And people would say, oh, of course, I got to do that. Uh, but then the idea is, why don't you do it before you hire someone? Uh, so, and I'm going to go back to my first search assignment. This was like four years ago, uh, but it's a good story is I took my first search project was a plant manager for a company making automotive components. And I knew the president of the company. So I became a recruiter and Mike who was the president a job description. This is a long time ago. They didn't have internet. Uh, they had job descriptions and it listed have to have 10 to 15 years experience, has to have an engineering degree, has to work for these kind of companies, has to have this many years, has to sound like this results, all the same stuff that people put on today. And I looked at that job description and said, Mike, that's not a job description. That's a person description. A job doesn't have skills, experience, competencies, and academic background. That's what a person does. Let's put this person description in the parking lot. Tell me what you want the person to do. Oh, what a question. I want someone to turn around the plant. 
So we walked through the manufacturing plant for an hour and we found seven things a person needed to do to turn the plant around a year. So the biggest problem that people have when hiring can't, they don't understand what the job is. They just assume the person will know. They assume the recruiter will know. They'll assume. So they tell me about yourself. No, tell me about yourself in relationship to turning the plant around. Tell me about yourself in terms of launching a new product. But but if you spend time up front understanding the job, you hire people who are competent and motivated to do that job. So that's the biggest pitfall. Once you undefine, define the job as a series of performance objectives, you have a, a chance to accurately assess competency. If you don't do that, it's problematic. You just might get someone, might not. Okay. And so based on that, um, you know, having a very clear description of what the role actually entails and maybe the key performance indicators or whatever it might be what are the most relevant interview questions I know that's it's hard to possibly generalize that because it might well, be I, I, it's not hard it's different. very easy for me okay <laughs> so, 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 give, me, so give us some insight what are the best well, questions to kind of dig I in? talked to um who's the yes somebody asked me a question he read the, the book and he and in the book I said the most important question of all time and basically, and it happened when I was at some presentation or some meeting with a, a bunch of executives and someone asked me, and it was one-on-one, -on -one, it wasn't in front of the whole group. Uh, he said, if I was just going to ask, spend 15 minutes with someone and ask one question, what would that question be? And I said, that's, that's interesting. Why don't you just ask the person to tell you about the best thing he or she ever did in her whole career, the biggest thing you've ever accomplished, and then compare that to what you need done. Now, asking the question is, hey, the, tell, Suzanne, tell me about the biggest thing you've ever done. Now, most candidates will talk one or a minute or so. Engineers will talk 30 seconds. And account, people who are techie, it'll really be hard to pull it out. If you're a marketing person or an extroverted, you'll talk forever and you think you get the right answer. But you have to tailor the response. When did you do it? Why did you get assigned to the project? What were the problems you faced? Uh, how did you make decisions? How did you overcome problems? How did you work with the team? Uh, how did you put the plan together? What was the environment like? So there's a lot of peeling the onion to that. But what I always do is, so this, so now I go back to this plant manager spot. I knew they had to turn the plan around. So I just said, hey, I don't remember the guy's name. Well, actually, it's come back to me so many years later. I said, we have a plant that's about this guy, 300 people in it. They're doing this. Tell me about the biggest thing you've ever accomplished in turning a plant around. I'm working with a retail company in the United States and they're looking for a director of stores. So I said, okay, walk me through, uh, and I don't know a lot about retail, but I do know that they need to uh, change the whole stores because they're adding new product lines. And there's also you got post COVID or pre COVID and post COVID and all this, and you have to retrain. I said, hey, we got to completely overhaul the stores with new products, new training, new materials, and new merchandising. Walk me through something you've ever accomplished that's related to that. And I spent 10 or 15 minutes talking with a guy who had done it. Then, he could do it. I mean, it was just, so it's the idea of once you know the job, then you just ask the candidate uh, to explain accomplishments related to that job. I mean, I know that sounds simple uh, and contextually or, uh, in an, uh, you know, intuitively it is simple. It's hard to get people to talk that way. And it's most hard though, to get hiring managers to define the work that way. Somehow, even though that's logical, defining the work, they just, I oh, know I 10 years experience. I need this. I need that. Well, that's not going to cut it in today's world. That's why a Fortune magazine article two weeks ago that said two thirds of people getting hired want to leave in 90 days because the job isn't what they thought it was. It's all the same issue. If you don't tell people what they're going to be doing and hire them for that, it's problematic if they'll be successful and satisfied. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I suppose you mentioned something earlier about, you know, some people will have rehearsed their interviews. So how, I suppose, do you avoid hiring the wrong person based on a gut feeling or emotional bias or seeing through somebody who's maybe extremely well versed in interviewing versus somebody who might mightn't be but they they actually do have the skill set or the competencies well that, that's a hard one to i mean let's say this critical because uh that's probably the most common two causes of common errors number one of uh, trusting your gut feeling, and number two, not knowing the job. You put both of those together, it's just pure random luck. It's like being in Vegas. Uh, <laughs> but the idea is, and I say controlling emotions is a hard thing to do. So let me kind of give another story, which I think kind of summarizes that whole idea. So this is, I was only being recruited five years, so this is long, long ago. But I had a person for a cost accounting manager position. And uh, I knew that they were looking for this candidate. And I wanted the client. It was 
long ago and it was, uh, but the VP of, or the VP controller loved my candidate, the director of financial planning loved my candidate, the director of internal audit loved my candidate, and they're all accounting leaders. And even the VP manufacturing and the head of IT loved my candidate. So this was a very good candidate, but he was quiet and soft-spoken. The CFO, the chief financial officer of the company, a very direct, in-your-face, dominant uh, alpha male. I mean, over the top. Uh, I mean, it's just, uh, you cower in his presence. Well, he and I went to battle a few times, but that's neither here nor there. Before I ever met him, he met my candidate for 10 or 15 minutes and basically screamed at me for sending in a candidate who was clearly incompetent. This was after everyone else interviewed him and loved him. Uh, and I, after a while, after taking this abuse for three or four minutes of him yelling and telling me how incompetent I was, I said, are you aware what you want this person to accomplish? And he said, yeah, I want a good cost manager. I said, no, that's not what your team told me because he didn't have anything to do. I said, they told me they wanted this person to implement this new state-of-the-art cost system at four manufacturing plants, three in the United States, one in Puerto Rico, and one you're building in Southeast Asia. Yeah, okay, that's right. And I said, well, have you, did you ask the candidate if he or she did it? Or he did anything like that? No. He's just too soft to do that. And I said, no, you're wrong. He actually did that with a big automotive company. I went through all the details of where he had done that, why he was chosen for the job, what happened in terms of recognition, a lot of evidence. And it turns out the only reason uh, the candidate was even available, his wife was getting her MD degree at a local university, a big, a very well-known university, but uh, to get her master's degree or P her MD degree and doing a residency down here. And he was here for three years. And I said, you just lost out the best possible candidate. His personality is the reason he was successful with unions, with manufacturing people, with cost people, uh, with systems people, and recognized by the same exact company you want to implement the system here as an expert in this field. And you just walked away from him. So now the short answer was he was blown away by the evidence. So the salute, the evidence can overcome emotions and facts. The, can, the CFO and I became, I can't say we became good friends, but he respected my approach to collecting evidence. He gave us half a dozen other search assignments over the next year. He went to another major company, gave us another half a dozen search assignments. He just loved the methodology of evidence. And so he said, my first book, <clears throat> that's not true, the first, the title of Higher With Your Head, which was my first real book, the subtitle was, uh, I think it was called High With Your Head, A Rational Way to Make a Gut Decision. Great title. I didn't come up with it. The editor came up with it. So, but it was a great title anyway. Uh, and it's re reality is you can't, there's always a gut component to it. But if you know the job, you collect evidence, you really control your biases, which is essential as you're at, uh, interviewing candidates, you have a good chance of making the right decision. But if you don't know the job and you let your emotions get into it, because if I like someone, you ask easy questions. If you don't like someone, you ask hard questions. And it's, it's pure random luck. And I'm going to contend that's the, we still have these exact same problems today for those exact reasons. Okay. So um, I know for, for example, with, with our company, one of the key elements when we're hiring people is culture fit. So how that's does what? that culture, culture fit? So oh, culture fit, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So how does that fit into performance based hiring or what's your thoughts around that? Well, let's, let me kind of give you the formula for hiring success, and then you'll see it. The formula for hiring set success is ability to do the work in relationship to fit. And fit is so important, it drives motivation, and motivation is so critical, it's squared. That equals results. So it's ability in relationship to fit drives motivation, which is squared, equals results. The fit is that component. Ability to do the work is hard and soft skills, team skills, project uh, management skills, organizational skills. Those are not simple to measure, but they're relatively straightforward. The fit factors are absolutely the most important factors. If you get the fit factors wrong, which includes fit with the company's culture, fit with the hiring manager, and fit with the job. So Suzanne, you might be a delightful person, but if you don't want to do the work, you're going to underperform. You might actually fit with the company's values and uh, overriding uh, themes of the company, but if you don't like your hiring manager, <laughs> Uh, that's the person who drives 50 to 70% of your culture is who you work for. Uh, so the idea is the fit factors, fit with the culture. And I look at that as the pace of the organization, the intensity of the organization, the resources. That's a good proxy for culture. If you don't have enough people to work and you're going and a company is struggling or growing fast, 
that's a that's a pretty intense culture. No matter what anybody puts on top of it, it's an intense culture. You then add the hiring manager's relationship with the subordinate, another critical component, and then the actual motivation to do the work. You could be perfectly competent to be a senior level accountant, but if you don't want to do it anymore, you're going to be incompetent. So, I mean, it's so those fit factors are where the variables all come into play in terms of focusing on ability. And that's why when you look at it, hey, I'm interviewing a candidate. I like you. You seem smart. You got the right academic. Oh, you can do the job. No, there's so many variables that go on that we just ignore. So that's why the, the idea of uh, a rational way to make a gut decision is doing it. You never get it all, but you get a lot of it if you understand the job and conduct a thorough, in-depth, performance-based interview. Sure. I mean, it's really fascinating. And and like you said, the stats you mentioned earlier, they, they speak for themselves at 90 days. But in reality, I, people aren't, the majority probably aren't doing this well or performance-based hiring. Um, why not? Why isn't the penny dropped as much about this? That's yet? A question. I am, I've been asking that question myself long before you were born, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it, this is, it's kind of when you talk, explain it to people, oh yeah, it makes sense. It's actually doing it every time at scale that doesn't make sense. But then you get, and I'm actually going to make the ten- contention that the internet was a net, was a loss for the hiring market. In the olden days, before you were born, but your parents probably knew it, to get a changing a job was hard work pre-internet, pre, you know, let's say uh, 1990. It was hard to get a job, it, it change job. You had a job, uh, if you got aggravated, it was really physically, demand. you had to go look for a post or a job in a newspaper. You had to send an email or a letter. I don't remember the word, word letters. I don't think I have any stamps anymore. Uh, and you had to wait two weeks. By that time, uh, your short-term emotions kind of dissipated. If it really was long-term and you, it still uh, was a real significant long-term problem, you would change. You'd do whatever you needed to. But you wouldn't do it just because you're aggravated for a day or two. Nowadays, you're aggravated. Oh, my boss yelled at me. I'm quitting. I'm quitting this afternoon. I'm going to find another job tomorrow. And I got two interviews by the end of the week. I mean, it's too easy to change jobs now. So, and part of it is now candidates are thinking the short-term. Companies are thinking short-term. So you said, oh, I got to get someone to fill that job. Suzanne left, I got to fill it with somebody else. So uh, with Richard or with whomever. Uh, and you, so everybody's, uh, how much money are you paying? Okay, then, so everything is about what you get on the start date, not about the work. So we've made changing jobs a transaction. We've made it. So now companies come by, so let's, be, let's do this simple process more. Let's do this silly process more efficiently. Let's let people change jobs faster, quicker, and we'll do it even quicker to make it worse. So I think we're in this kind of um, rut where we're just trying to fill jobs, not uh, hire for the future, or hire uh, for a candidate looking, I just want the most money. I don't really know what the job is, but if I get paid more, I'll be happy. And 30 to 60 days later, you're not happy. Money doesn't drive satisfaction. It's the work you're doing, the team you're doing with the culture. So all of these things we talk about, when you really look at it, it's, we've made, we've cheapened work. We made jobs a transaction. And it continues. And you, you post more jobs. Oh, post more jobs. People are leaving. And let's hire them as fast as we can, do, being as silly as we hired them in the first place. So that's this wheel that we're just going through. It's just like this rat race, which I don't see any end. As you can tell, I'm pretty cynical about this. That's why I get kicked out of a lot of business meetings where I <laughs> say, hey, stop posting jobs. Um, let's offer people real careers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the hard part is, hey, you know, we're into this, uh, hey, let's just fill jobs as fast as we can with whoever replies. Yeah, no, you make a great point there, especially about how times have changed, that it's just, it's so easy to leave a job. It's so easy to interview people, um, you know, with the likes of Zoom or whatever it is mm-hmm. online, that it is, it has made it, as you say, you can be quite reactive and you can just say, yeah, I'm, I've had it. I'm I'm out of here on to the next thing. So, um, yeah, it's it's a strange world, I suppose, now compared to maybe like where this. you came from originally when you started. Actually your started, I'm going to say in the mid 90s is when the Internet came and all the systems came, became available and job boards really just jumped out and companies were interested in selling job postings. I mean, all these job boards, they make money by turnover. So they they don't want to solve the problem. They want to their business model is, hey, the more job posts we get, the more money we make. Uh, so we make it easier for candidates. So then I post a job on LinkedIn or Indeed or some big job board. Everybody, all my other jobs are posted. They're exactly the like. 
And they, the candidates they send to me, they also send the candidates to every other job posting. So their focus is on um, selling job postings, which exacerbates the problem. It doesn't solve the problem, even though they have this fancy marketing that says it does. No, they just aggro and they sell more postings. I actually talked to a big job board and said, uh, why don't you make it hard to apply? Oh, no, we wouldn't make any money. So it didn't go anywhere, obviously. My idea didn't go anywhere. Um, okay, so back to, I suppose, the actual um, appliance of these evidence-based interviewing techniques. Um, I suppose you've, you've mentioned a couple of them throughout our conversation so far, but could you kind of quickly summarize that, I suppose? And then my next question um, after that is, is it role specific? So I suppose this is a project management uh, podcast, focused podcast. Um, so is there a different technique uh, for interviewing a project manager versus a marketing person or a sales rep or an accountant, um, in your view? Well, meth let's say this. The difference is the actual performance objectives of the job. The basic core performance-based interview is uh, asking the hiring manager to define the key performance objectives, which are a, a KPI is a subset. Uh, KPI is the met the end result. The KPO key performance objective is the means to get the KPI. So uh, we need to uh, upgrade our accounting and reporting systems with it by year end. That's a system. We need to launch a new product. Hey, we've got to upgrade our whole st uh, store manager system and training system. Those are outcomes. So it's outcome based. The idea of the interview is to get once you have three or four or five of these performance objectives, you have you really spend a lot of time digging into the candidate's accomplishments related to those performance objectives and the environment. Hey, Suzanne, what was the culture like? What was the pace like? What was your boss like? And you constant and you repeat those over all the time. So you see this trend of performance over time. There's a little more to it than that, but that's 80% of it. You get that right, you're in the game. Uh, now, adding the project management, it turns out that most jobs are project manager jobs. I, you're an accountant. You got to install a new uh, reporting system by year end because you've opened up three new facilities around the world and the reporting is uh, convoluted. So you got to come up, you got to work with uh, systems, you got to work with uh, the operations themselves, their reports, and you got to put all the accounting and this county's got to report it to some government body. That's a project. So if I was interviewing an accounting for, hey, tell, walk me through, Suzanne, well, you've ever done something like that? And I peel it away. How did you get the project? How'd you organize it? How'd you plan the project? With a project manager, they're already dealing with projects. So, I, so if I was taking a project management spot, uh, tell me about the projects, how big the projects are, what's the challenges, what kind of projects would the person handle, what kind of tools are they using to manage the project, uh, are the tools satisfactory, who's on the team. What, so the idea is once you understand the work, you just then break it down into, hey, walk me through how you've done it. So I don't, conceptually, there's no difference. The difference is the work that the person needs to do, and most work that people have to do, whether you're launching a new product line, well, that's a project. You're turning around a plant, well, that's a project. You're upgrading a system, well, that's a project. So projects, project managers handle, always handle projects. So it turns out that when I, when I, and I actually have spoken to business groups of project managers, they get it instantly. They said, you know, they said, oh, you're just asking a person's project and walking them through every step of the project. And they say, oh, of course. So project managers kind of instantly pick up the whole methodology. Other people kind of have to explain, uh, other functions have to explain it. So I think project managers pretty well understand the, the concepts right away. Excuse me. Okay, um, great. So I suppose we've been talking from a recruiter point of view. So if we, uh, I suppose, went to the other side of the table, and I, I assume the... Um, the opinions that you'd have would be the same, but advice, should I say, would be the same for a project manager going for a role. Um, in your experience, what would you say, what, what advice would you give them? Or, you know, I think you mentioned earlier about how engineers can kind of whip through something in 30 seconds where a marketing person could talk for 25, 30 minutes and talk with their hands if they're anything like me. So what would you give project managers going for roles? Uh, what advice would you give them? Okay, so there's a slight plug. I wrote a, uh, the, the book, Hire With Your Head, was a major publishing company, had three editions. I had the fourth edition. I wanted to make it candidate-facing as well as hiring manager-facing, I mean, for both sides. 
the publishing company didn't want to do it. They didn't want two different audiences. So I had a, a different book publisher and the book was titled The Essential Guide for Hiring and Getting Hired. Uh, and since I spent so many time, so much time with candidates who are my candidates, I knew what they had to do to interview well. Uh, but the book is The Essential Guide for Hiring and Getting Hired. I'll give you the, the nutshell of it. I tell candidates is uh, it's likely you as a candidate are not going to be interviewed properly unless that hiring manager interview is taken this class, which is unlikely that it's taken. We haven't trained uh, 1% of the people in the world. So 99.9% .9 likelihood you, they didn't ask you a bunch of stupid questions and they'll, if they like you, you'll get the job. If they don't like you, you won't get the job. Uh, I said, the interview you go through, don't, I tell candidates, don't feel bad if you blow the interview. It has nothing to do with you. It has, it's a marketing gimmick. It's a gimmick. And I said, if you do great in the interview, don't feel so proud of yourself. You just were a good talker or a good marketing person. I said, however, if you want to be judged properly, this is what you have to do. Very early on in the interview, and if you're a project manager and you go for that role, I'd say, what I'd like you to do, Suzanne, as soon as you meet the hiring manager, stop. I guarantee they're going to just chat about something silly. I want you to stop the interview and ask the hiring manager a minute or two, hey, would you mind telling me about some of the projects that I'm going to be handling in this job or just roughly the types of projects? Because I'd like to give you examples of work that I've done that are most comparable to that. So you just take control of the interview. Now, number one, if you ask the question, the hiring manager, oh, making it easy for me. Hiring managers, they don't like the interview. They don't know how to do it. You don't know what you're doing. You just kind of stumble through it and you make a quick judgment because it's painful. But if the interview, if the candidate can start leading the interview and say, okay, Suzanne, tell me what you're looking for in this job. Uh, oh, that's interesting. You got this, what kind of projects you're working on? Would you think? You, uh, and you just kind of get the sense and then you start a conversation. Oh, I remember I had a project like that where I had the same problem. Let me tell you about it. So you give these stories. So I, the, the idea is you have to give specific evidence, titles, dates, um, forms. So if as a candidate, you also have to give specific evidence that it's proof. You can't say, oh, I'm perfect. I'm really good at that. I really like to do that. And you can talk three to four minutes in generalities. That's forgotten. I've debriefed literally after candidates have interviewed a hiring manager. I've called the hiring manager. I and mean, this is thousands of times over 35 years. Uh, and I say, what do you think of that candidate? Uh, pretty good. I like them. But I really like this. Can Why? They can give me the evidence. They say, oh, I remember that night, uh, three years ago, the person handled this project. And it's interesting. Managers remember the specific details. They don't remember a lot of it. They just remember that detail. And then from that, they, oh, yeah, I remember that. They remember everything else. It's like they put this little filing cabinet in their brain with a date, uh, piece of data. Uh, generalities. And candidates come back, well, I told them all about that. No, you didn't. You Spoken a bunch of generalities that are forgetting. They're forgetful. Or not forgetful. They're just unmemorable. Um, so it's the idea of ask the manager some of the projects they're going to be handling. Give examples of projects you've handled that are most comparable. Give real specific data with real evidence, and you will do a great job of being interviewed. Just asking the question alone, you'll be branded as assertive, uh, and you'll also be branded as competent. Two good things to uh, get out of an interview and get those two things uh, checked off on your box here high probability you'll be a finalist. Absolutely. Um, I, 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 I totally agree. If somebody came in to me and had, I suppose, that quantitative um, examples ready to go and kind of took ownership, I'd be like, get in here, get in here, get on my team. Um, it's just great initiative and competency, as you say. Um, well, I have found that really interesting, especially as um, I'm actually about to start interviewing candidates. So I'm going to try my best to uh, performance-based hire and use those evidence-based uh, interview techniques. So thank you so much for joining us today, Lou. Um, I'm sure people will want to know more about you um, or your book. So could you tell our audience maybe where they could uh, find out more about you or where they could maybe publish or purchase your books online? If they just look up higher with Lou Adler, higher with your head, you'll find me or Lou Adler LinkedIn. You'll find me. Follow me on LinkedIn. I give a lot of these tips. There's a lot of downloads I give. Uh, even the articles have downloads of like that interview form or their interview guide. So I, a lot of the people who work who work with my company think I give too many things away, but uh, to, so be it. Uh, nonetheless, so <laughs> Lou Adler on LinkedIn or Lou Adler higher with your head. Uh, you can find a book on Amazon or any place where they sell books now. I don't know where else they sell books, though. So, but I know Amazon sells them still. Um, 
so that would be the way to do it and happy to chat and delightful chatting with you too, Suzanne. And I'll look forward to maybe chatting again or hearing about the results of your interviewing anyway. Oh, I'll definitely have to follow up with you and let you know how I got on. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much, Lou. We will actually drop your details into the podcast notes so people can connect with you on LinkedIn um, or uh, search online for your book. So thank you so much. And Welcome. we'll speak thank to you, you again soon. Bye. Bye-bye.